Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back. It is uh, the start of season two for Workbench Wednesday. I want to give a big uh, thanks to Taylor, our graphic artist at uh, back at the office at Lionel, who put together the new little intro slide video thingamajiggy there for us. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so thanks, Taylor, for doing that. Uh, he does a great job, and um, you know, since he's come on board, we've been able to do a lot of wonderful things with uh, catalog video and YouTube videos and instructional things, and we're just just getting started with uh, with things. And he's been a great addition to the team. So nice to throw some uh, shout outs to uh, another great asset that we've got at, at Lionel. Um, I want to thank everybody. I'm sorry we were supposed to start this off last week. Uh, had a bit of a family emergency, uh, but everything is okay, and we're back on track. And want to uh, to get things started because it's uh, it, the days are getting shorter. It's uh, actually comfortable enough to stay outside in North Carolina for more than three minutes. Uh, so it's getting close to model railroad season again. And we're much looking forward to getting back into the action. Tonight's topic is going to be sort of back to the basics. Um, want to talk a little bit about good railroad operations and what you can do to help reduce derailments and other problems uh, on your trains. Because no matter how well detailed they are, no matter how, uh, how much fun they can be, uh, derailments certainly can um, ruin some of that fun and make it a little bit, little bit more uh, hard to enjoy. So um, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the basics. This might not be as fun and exciting as uh, weathering a, uh, a locomotive or uh, scratch building a structure or doing scenery work, but the time you spend doing these little things uh, are really, uh, really does matter and can make an impact on how you enjoy your layout overall. And um, hopefully you'll see that some of these, these things that you can do are very easy. They don't take a lot of time. Heck, it's a great Sunday afternoon activity while you're sitting there watching the football game and you need something to do during the commercials, right? So uh, this is a, a, a fun thing to do and, and multitask, uh, and which, will, which will make everybody happy. You can tell them you're multitasking. You're not just watching football all day. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, gauge and trucks and standards, uh, and car weights, and what you can do for lubrication and cleaning. Uh, with your rolling stock and locomotives to have an enjoyable operating session when you're running your trains today. Um, and with that started, let's go ahead and say, let's go ahead and get started here. Let me uh, bring in the other camera so you can see a little bit of what I'm working on. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different scales and gauges today. So I've got um, an O gauge car here we'll look at. I've got some HO equipment. The tips I'm going to be talking about really do work in every scale and gauge uh, there's a, you know maybe a few little things different here and there, but for the most part, whatever scale you're working in, uh, you'll be able to take some of this advice and apply it. So it's not a uh, specific to one particular product or product line. This works with Lionel trains. This works with any manufacturer's trains. Uh, so you'll be in good shape. Um, and with that in mind, one of the things that places I want to start is interchangeability and standards and how you can run Lionel and MTH rolling stock on the same track or uh, Lionel and Ather and HO rolling stock on the same track in, in HO scale. And be, for a lot of that, we really have the National Model Railroad Association to thank. Um, the NMRA is a national organization that is devoted to uh, the entire model railroad hobby. And they do a lot of work with manufacturers, with clubs, with uh, with everybody um, uh, involved. It's a wonderful organization to be involved in. I think a lot of times it gets sort of a rap as an HO or an N scale uh, or scale modeling club. Uh, and it's really not strictly devoted to that at all. Uh, it, there is sort of a slant to that based off of the number of people in those scales in the hobby. But the NMRA has developed standards for every scale and gauge. And these standards include everything from track to rolling stock, to locomotives, to control systems. There are modular standards, uh, which they use for club layouts uh, so that people can interchange from one club to another. There really are a, a whole host of standards. And as modern railroad manufacturers, we very frequently refer to those standards uh, as we're developing new products, testing our product to make sure that there is some universal interchangeability of parts and equipment between all of our things. 
Uh, not always possible, for example, legacy and DCS, but uh, the DCC standards, on the other hand, are very much NMRA driven and controlled. Um, legacy and DCS sort of predated a lot of that, that function, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but um, you can see that the advantages, if you're an HO scale modeler or a scale modeler, you definitely see the advantages of uh, the NMRA and what they bring to, uh, to the hobby. So if you're not a member of the NMRA, I'd encourage you to, to take a look. Uh, whether you're a member or not, their website is one that you should know, and it's a very simple one. It's nmra.org. I will put that one up here for you real quick. Uh, I got it. There we go. Uh, check out nmra.org. When you get to their homepage, one of the things you'll see at the top of the page is a note for standards. And when you click on the standards page, you will get uh, all of the printouts and all, or a list of all of the, the standards for everything for every gauge, whether it is uh, wheel sets or track or switch points, whatever you're looking for, that's there. Uh, so that's the place to go if you want the, the printed standards and a uh, very handy reference to have on hand. The other item that the NMRA, NMRA provides are these standard gauges. And if you don't have one of these in your toolbox, you definitely need to pick one up. These are available for, again, pretty much every scale and gauge out there, including a lot of the narrow gauge uh, scale. So HON3, uh, ON30, a lot of those gauges have, uh, the scales and gauges have these standards gauges available too. They're not terribly expensive. Um, if you're a member, you get a discount. Uh, and some hobby shops and things do carry these as well uh, because the NMRA is going to great lengths to make sure that everybody has access to, to this device uh, so that we can all enjoy our trains together. And as you can see, it's a very simple one piece uh, stamped metal uh, tool, but it, as you look around the gauge, it has lots of different indentations and angles, all of which have some purpose and meaning. Uh, the ones we're gonna look at most frequently are your track gauge. Uh, and tonight we're also gonna use the wheel gauge here on this side. Um, very, very handy tool to have. I've got about three of these uh, that I keep in different toolboxes so that if I'm on the road at a show uh, or at the office or here at home or uh, working in different places, I've always got one of these handy uh, because it's one of those things you don't miss until you don't have it. So for as inexpensive as they are, it's, it's, a, tool, it's a good tool to have uh, a couple extras for. Um, let's start off because I've got the HO gauge here um, with wheel sets. And this is one of our Lionel HO uh, hopper cars uh, that I unboxed here tonight. Uh, I'm going to give a quick check out and see how it works. Anytime you get a new piece of rolling stock, not a bad idea to go ahead and give it a quick standards check before you put it on the layout. Uh, that will help you um, to determine uh, if you're going to have any problems before you get started. And usually everything's gonna be A-OK, -okay, but you may find something that's a little bit off and it's a quick and easy fix now. Um, Justin asks, can you explain what you would start out with O scale or HO scale? Justin, that is entirely up to you. Um, when I was younger, I started out with HO scale. I very much enjoy O scale. I have dabbled in pretty much every scale uh, imaginable from Z scale up into um, inch and a half live steam. Uh, so I've, I've played with a lot of different, uh, model trains over the years and there's advantages to each and every one of them. If you find the, uh, find the scale that, that sort of suits your, 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 your liking, uh, you can choose to stick with it forever or, or wander around. The great thing about what we're going to go over here tonight, a lot of these things are standard and they will apply to just about every, whatever scale you, you, you choose. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the wheel gauge here on the car. And to do that, we're going to use the, the side of the template marked wheels. And I'm just going to simply line that up. And the two flanges of the wheels should fall right into those gaps. And here in this first wheel set, they do. The flange of the wheel is this raised lip on the inside of the, the wheel surface. And uh, this is what keeps the car engaged. It's what keeps the car on the track and, and staying parallel with the rails. The tread of the wheel is the, the larger flat part out here. Uh, the tread of the wheel is gonna become very important to us when we talk about cleaning wheels. The flange of the wheel is very important when we talk about uh, track gauge 
because if the flanges are too, if the wheel gauge here is too narrow or too broad, you'll have problems going through switches. You may have problems going around some, uh, some, some curves and whatnot, because those tighter flanges, if they're too broad, they can cause the car to roll up. If they're too narrow, you can have the car drop in and, um, and that, that can be, a, be an issue for you. So the, the flange is important. The other part of this is also the depth of the flange. Now, you won't find many problems with flange depth in model trains today because that's been very much standardized by manufacturers in, in any scale and gauge. Um, but there is also the, the depth of these little channels here is also part of the gauge. It's not just the distance between them. It's also the, the depth. So if the tread of the wheel isn't riding on that, that edge, then you have a high flange. Uh, that could be an issue uh, going across a uh, track that's a lower uh, code height. It could be an issue going through some switches and so forth. You may run into a high gauge problem on some older model trains. You probably won't find that on anything you're buying new today, certainly not from Lionel or really honestly any other uh, major model train manufacturer. Uh, that's one of the things that got standardized roughly about 70 years or so ago. Uh, but we'll just quickly check and that one's good. That one's good. Good. And good. Well, the factory did a good job on this one, uh, which is very nice to see. Um, but it does create a bit of a problem for me. And that what I'd like to do is show you how to fix one that's not right. Uh, so let me grab another wheel set here that's already loose. Well, before I do that, let me show you how you take a wheel set out of the... Uh, out of the, the truck. Most cars with plastic wheel sets, and this is true of our, our O-gauge cars with plastic wheels as well, all you really have to do is simply bend the truck a little bit and pop that wheel right out. It's a very easy removable uh, operation that lets you get that wheel out in a hurry. Uh, and then popping it in is just the same. Just give it a little bit. There's enough flex in these plastic side frames that they just pop. We'll go back and double check and make sure that this is uh, nice and tight. Hold on one second. I am getting a phone call. <laughs> ignore that one. That would be our China team who's now coming to work. Um, okay, so we've got the wheel gauge. Let me grab another loose wheel set. On the All right, this will be a little easier to show outside of the, the truck. Most wheels uh, are pressed onto the axle. And if you twist and pull, you can change the, the dimension of that a little bit. Now, I've pressed, twisted and pushed in a little bit here on the wheel. Usually one is pretty tight and one is movable, so you can make that adjustment. Now, if I did that right, I probably kicked this wheel out of gauge. So let's go ahead and check that. And yes, you can very clearly see here that this wheel is not engaged. It is not popping into that, that second groove. We have, so we're rocking it back and forth, doing this in front of a fixed camera challenge. Okay, so this is not an engaged wheel, and that's going to cause a problem for us. Let me hide that band while we're at it. Okay, so to, to fix the problem that I just created, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to grab the two wheels, twist, and pull apart a little bit. Okay, and then check again. Still not quite enough. And now it looks like, yes, now I've got it. So if I come right here now, you see we're dropping right in that wheel set. So that's all there is to it. Uh, a little bit of pressure in and out, and usually twisting a little bit on the wheels as you do it will help you slide those those wheels into position. Again, showing you on an HO wheel works on, on pretty much any scale or gauge. Okay, so that's all you have to do to put a wheel back in into gauge if you find one that's slightly out of gauge. These, once they're in gauge, are typically not going to wander. Uh, but it's a good idea as you're checking your cars regularly for maintenance, while you're checking it for lubrication and other things or cleaning wheels, just check that real quick. Probably aren't going to have to make any adjustments, 
but it's uh, it's just a nice thing to check as you're doing doing the work. Next thing I want to move on to here is applying lubrication uh, to these wheels because this is another thing that you'll you'll get questions about a lot. And no matter what type of wheel set you're using, uh, you'll run into a similar issue, and that is to reduce friction. You want to have uh, have proper lubrication. Now, what kind of uh, lubrication should we use? I've got a little set here uh, that I keep on my workbench. This one happens to be from Woodland Scenics, I believe. Uh, but there are, if you go into your hobby shop, you will find any number of greases like this. And for trucks and wheel sets, what I like to use is a light oil. We have one right here. Light oil. That's the one we have that's already open. Yes. Okay, so this is a, a simple light oil. This is plastic compatible. That may or may not be an issue for you with the wheels you're using, but better safe than sorry, right? Even if you're using all metal wheel axles and metal trucks, a plastic compatible oil is still going to work just fine for you, uh, and you won't have any, any issues down the road. When we apply oil to wheels, and actually I'm going to switch over to an O-gauge car here just because it'll be a little bit bigger and a little easier for you to see. Uh, this is one of our O-Gage train set hopper cars. My wife's Frosty the Snowman car, so I can't screw it up. I'm going to pop this hole in it. Maybe. All right, same idea. We take the screw, we take the truck out of the, uh, the truck the same way. And what I'm looking at here now is the truck side frames and the journal. Okay. Um, a little bit of quick railroad terms here. So we can go, again, we're talking, going back to basics. So I don't want to assume that uh, everybody knows things. Some real basics on truck terminology that you'll hear a lot in model railroading. This part here that we see the most when we look at a truck, this is called the side frame. Right? Down the center of the car is the bolster that connects the two side frames. And then the point where the axle rides in the side frame is called the journal. Up until the, well, it started in about the 1920s and 30s, but more standardized by the 1960s uh, when, was when you saw roller bearings coming into place. Prior to that, uh, they used what we call a friction bearing. Now, of course, there's a little bit of friction in every bearing. That's, that's the idea. Um, but these used a, uh, a machined uh, piece of brass that sat on top of the axle. We had the axle of the car here coming through the side frame. You had a piece of brass that sits on top of that axle, uh, and that would support the weight of the car between that and then the side frame resting on top of the brass. Underneath the, uh, the axle and the brass, uh, there's a, a part of the, uh, the journal box here. Uh, obviously, it just as well here on this car, it's a little bit more close to prototype detail. Uh, and that would be packed with a waste material and kept soaked with oil. And so as the axle turns, it would wick the oil up off of that uh, waste batting and keep the brass um, lubricated and cool. And that's what kept the train wheels rolling. Uh, in reality, if the oil runs low, you uh, would generate more heat from the friction of the brass riding right on the axle. And it wouldn't take long under the weight and, uh, and speeds of a, of a freight car uh, before you generate significant heat. And then that typically would ignite whatever waste oil and whatnot was still in the car, which is what we call a hot box. Uh, and we still call them hot boxes today, even though the, the roller bearings make this a lot less common. Uh, it can still happen. And if it's not corrected fast enough, you can actually score or snap the axle and then you get a, a major derailment. So hot boxes were a pretty frequent cause of problems on the real railroads until about the 1960s and 70s when uh, the roller bearings really fell out of favor, uh, friction bearings really fell out of favor to roller bearings. Uh, and it's still something that has to be watched for today. And now we have sensors along the tracks and so forth that look for that. We've got a great uh, Lionel operating accessory that, that mimics one of those trackside sensors. But I've sort of digressed here. Uh, just like the prototype, we want to keep our journals uh, well oiled. So with the, the wheel and axle off, it's a simple matter to put a small drop of this light oil in the bearing. 
uh, on each side frame, on each side of the wheel. Okay, it does not take much. Just a small little drop is all you need in there, uh, and you will be just fine for a good long time. If you have a wheel that is squeaking, that's a good time, good uh, sign that it is time to put in a little bit of oil and uh, and. The, and uh, I guess as I say, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, that's a great sign of it's time to change your oil or add some oil. But it does not take much. You don't need to pour a whole lot in there uh, to keep things lubricated. A little dab will do you. Uh, and we'll do both, both axles here, of course. This same plastic compatible oil I use uh, in O-Gage, HO, uh, American Flyer, it works in, in all that rolling stock. Uh, so very easy to use. A tube of this stuff will last you a long, long time. So uh, don't worry about uh, spending a little bit and getting a good, good oil. There are multiple manufacturers out there who produce lightweight uh, oils for, for model hobbies. I really don't have one to recommend over another. Get a good plastic compatible, lightweight oil, and you'll be just fine. The Lionel maintenance kit, or a Labelle, or a Woodland Phoenix, whatever your hobby shop has on hand, is going to do you just fine. Uh, but this is, you can see, takes a couple of seconds per car. Um, before I move on to couplers, and I'm going to set this aside just for a second because I want to talk a little bit about the, the coupler here before I put that that wheel back in. I want to mention one more thing on rolling stock, especially two rail rolling stock. So for our American Flyer guys and our HO guys, or if you've got any end scalers listening in, uh, this becomes much more important to you. Um, if you have an illuminated car, these cars have uh, an insulated wheel set. We don't have that issue with a three rail O gauge car. Two rail O, you'll have the same, same thing. If you look very carefully, I'm going to try and hold this up to where you can see it. Here on the uh, inside of the truck, inside of the, the flange. Here you'll see a little black insulator where the axle goes through the wheel. If I turn that over to the other side, looking backwards in the, in the mirror, you'll see there's no insulator there. Okay, It's important uh, because of the electrical contact in this, when you have a car that's illuminated like this one with, with uh, wipers on both ends, on each truck, those insulators need to be on the same side and then you want them on the opposite side on the other truck. So if on the left truck, they're on the, uh, as I have it oriented here, the, the top, then on the right truck, you want them on the, the bottom. Okay, if you don't do that, you'll get a short uh, with, when you put this on the track. So if, if you're taking things off to, to clean wheels or do some maintenance, uh, just keep that in mind when you put the car back together that you want your insulated wheels to, to line up so you don't have any, any short circuits. One other thing about wheels before we move on into cleaning as we make that transition, because that's the other big thing. Uh, you will find rolling stock in every scale and gauge with both plastic wheels and metal wheels. Lionel, most of what we produce um, is going to be a metal wheel, including uh, our HO line of trains. We do have some lower end cars that are plastic. On, uh, on rolling stock, the freight cars, it's not, the plastic wheel is not really that, that hard of a, of a problem. They'll track just fine. They'll roll just fine. The one difference that I typically notice with a, a plastic wheel over a metal wheel is they do tend to collect dirt a lot more quickly. Uh, so it's nice to, if you're, if you're cleaning your wheels, you don't have to do it quite as often with a, uh, with a metal wheel as you do a plastic wheel. In the smaller gauges, the, plastic, the metal wheels add a little bit of extra weight, uh, and they do tend to track a little bit. A little bit better too. I think you, you get a, a better quality with it. So I always recommend metal wheels over plastic wheels. If you're working in HO scale, uh, Lionel has replacement metal wheel sets that'll drop right into a lot of manufacturers' cars that are fairly inexpensive and an easy upgrade. Uh, if you're working in other scales, you'll find those those same replacements also. We're not the only only ones who do that. So if you do have some older rolling stock that has plastic wheels, it's an easy replacement. Pop out the old wheel set, pop in the new one. Um, but something that I, I do recommend. As you run your trains, they do pick up dirt and, and they do they do get dirty. And as you build up dirt on the track, 
and you build up dirt on the uh, the wheel sets, you create a barrier for the electrical contact between the train and the, the track, which is supplying that power. And that's the easiest way you start to develop uh, electrical problems. So cleaning your track and cleaning your wheels is a pretty much a constant uh, necessary evil in model railroading. The smaller the scale in the gauge, the more pressing this issue becomes. It's definitely one advantage that G and O uh, and even S have over HO or N or Z. Kind of makes sense, right? The more contact area you have, the better the better you are, are off you are. So uh, keeping the tracks clean is a topic for another night. We'll go over that. Um, it's, there's a lot of different ideas and techniques on how to do it. A lot of people clean their track and they forget to ever clean their wheels. And if you clean the track, it's kind of like only dealing with half the problem, right? So you want to hit both of your, both the track and the wheels as you do these things. I'm going to show you a real easy way to clean wheels on rolling stock. We're going to start with a little scrap of track and a paper towel. And you can use the cleaner of your choice. There are several different camps on, on track and wheel cleaners. Some people like the denatured alcohol. Some people like uh, citrus cleaners like Goo Gone. Um, some people swear by specific brands that market these uh, their products specifically as a model train cleaner or an electrical contact cleaner. Um, I've had good results with all of these things. So honestly, pick what's working well for you and stick with it. Uh, I also typically look for things that don't cost a lot of money. And if I'm getting good results out of the bottle of alcohol that I can pick up at the drugstore, which used to be a lot easier than it has been for the last few years, but what now we can start maybe getting some alcohol in the drugstores again, uh, that's what I, I typically use. But I've had good results with, with plenty of other things. So I'm just going to put a little bit of denatured alcohol on here. Now, I'm not going to bother testing that hopper car. I literally just pulled that out of the box. So I know those wheels are clean and you're not going to see anything. This Polar Express car, uh, this was last run uh, the last time I went to a, a Model Railroad Club show. So it's got some good run time on it. Uh, and I don't think I I cleaned the wheels after we, we got home from the show. In fact, I know me. I'm pretty sure I, I'm really sure I did take the time to do that before I put the train away. So um, it has not seen the light of day in a little while. Uh, to clean the wheels on the rolling stock, I'm going to put it on a little piece of track here with a paper towel. And I'm just going to pull back and forth across that wet spot where the alcohol is and then into the dry spot of the paper towel. And I think you can already see what I'm getting here. Okay. We're pulling all of that dirt and grime, which is actually not really terrible in this case. Mostly what you're seeing there is the alcohol stain. Uh, but we're getting all of that dirt off of the tread of the wheels. Um, do the other side. You just turn the car around same thing. I have seen some rolling stock that has been running on display layouts uh, where the crud buildup on the wheels was so thick you could peel it off with a with a screwdriver or a hobby knife. That's definitely creating operational issues for you. Um, uh, the, the most extreme I saw, someone actually thought they had an out-of-gauge coupler and it was just because of the crud on the wheel. Once we cleaned the wheels off, the couplers fell back down into the right lane. Um, don't let your track and wheels get that far out of gauge. Uh, you'll have a much happier and longer uh, life out of your trains. So we did definitely get some gook off of off of that wheel. Not horrible, uh, but but a good cleaning. And as a lighted car, keeping those wheels as clean and shiny as possible is absolutely ideal. Uh, now, as I said, if you're running a, a car like, for example, this O gauge hopper car here, that I'm not worried about illumination in the car. It's got these centered wheels. Uh, they really don't pull in that much dirt. Uh, and you're not you're not dragging too much dirt and, and contributing too much to the problem. If you clean the wheels on this once every year or two as you're running trains, you're going to be just fine. Um, you're not uh, missing too much on this car if you don't keep the wheels regularly clean. With the lighted car, you'll start to see the, the lights in the car flicker. That's a great indication that it's time to clean wheels and or your track. Uh, so it's, it really helps with that. Now, this is great for locomotives, or sorry, for rolling stock that you could just drive back and forth across a paper towel. 
it's not as easy with um, with a locomotive, right? Because the wheels tend to lock up on you. So with a locomotive, what I'll do is same idea. I'll put some glue, uh, cleaner on a, a towel and set it on a, a stretch of track, set the locomotive on top, and then apply power to the track and hold on to the engine and let the wheels spin. Uh, and as they do, just apply enough pressure to let the wheels clean themselves right on the track. Easy peasy. Uh, and it takes just a few minutes and you've cleaned up uh, your locomotive wheels. Uh, works well in every scale and gauge. Somewhere down the road when we're set up on a module, I'll show you another really cool trick that you can do with a paper towel and some wire staples on the outside of the rails and one in the center. And you put a straight strip of paper towel through. And then as your train runs by, you swipe the wheels across it every time your train goes around the track and keep your wheels clean. Uh, it's a neat little passive wheel cleaner thing. Not the most photogenic thing in the world, but it definitely works. And uh, you run a train through it and you realize just how much dirt is, is still on those train wheels. Uh, but we'll cover that little fun fun tip in another uh, another episode when we when I have a little bit more space and, and things set up to, to go here. All right, so great use for a little piece of track and uh, you're all set for cleaning wheels. Easy enough, right? Okay, I think I've covered everything I can cover on wheel cleaning and so forth. Chuck makes a great point. Uh, traction tire residue also contributes to wheel dirt and grime. Absolutely, it does. It's uh, that, that rubber traction tire. Uh, just just like plastic's more, uh, for lack of a better term, sticky uh, to, to grab onto all that dust and grime uh, than the metal wheels are, the rubber traction tires are even worse. Uh, so they do tend to pick up that stuff and, and hang on to it. Now, from a functionality of a traction tire standpoint, that's actually not a bad thing. <laughs> it's like putting some extra grit in the in the sandpaper. But from a layout track cleaning standpoint, yeah, yeah you've got a bit of an issue there. So uh, another thing to, to keep an, an eye out for. Thanks, thanks, Chuck, on that one. All right. I want to move on to couplers. Um, Next to wheels, couplers are probably the uh, the biggest thing that can come in and go wrong for you on a train, especially if you start running long trains and you get a lot of strain on those couplers and they start to, to snap and pop. Um, let's look at the, the parts of the coupler here for a, a little bit. We have a traditional knuckle coupler here. Um, the, the face of the coupler is what does, does the work. And then in most of our model couplers, couplers, you'll see a, a, a hinged pin here that allows that to open and close. If I pull the pin, I can open up that coupler. There is another pin inside the head of the knuckle that when this closes, you hear that click and it locks into place. Uh, and that little pin is what holds the coupler face together. This is actually not very much different from the way a prototype railroad coupler looks and functions. The operations here are very similar. We've just shrunken it down. Um, even though our couplers in most scales are still way out of scale for the, the car compared to what a prototype would be, the operations are very, very, very much similar, if not the, the same. Uh, the main difference is how we pull that pin. Um, so in this case, it's a, a plunger on the bottom of the car uh, or this tab on the side of the coupler. Sorry, I'm out of frame this tab here, or if you're using an electro uh, uncoupler, it energizes the tab underneath. Some of our other rolling stock have a more hidden tab under the center of the truck, under the bolster. It does the same thing. Uh, we also have electro couplers, a little bit different story. We'll handle that in another another call, but uh, the, the ideas here are pretty much the same. So you have a lot of moving parts on this that can, uh, over time, get gunked up or wear up. Typically, uh, dirt in the coupler is not too much of an issue um, if you keep them clean and don't, don't do anything crazy. Uh, but lubrication can be important. And most of the time, what I will use for coupler lubrication is a graphite material. We've got some of that here in the, the kit as well. We have some, some dry graphite. Uh, Again, very easy to find at hobby shops. Even if you have a hobby shop in your town that doesn't specialize in model trains, but does uh, race cars, model airplanes, uh, all those other other fun hobbies, these lubricants work with so many things. Uh, you know, I remember putting this stuff in Pinewood Derby cars uh, and and everything else. So 
uh, easy to find, uh, easy to get a hold of, you know, easy to get a hold of, and uh, any, any brand is going to work. Um, so don't don't worry that it has to be a YNL graph. I don't think we even sell graphite or have, but uh, don't worry that you have to find a brand specific to go with your trains. It's dry graphite. Um, and where I'm going to apply a little bit of uh, graphite is usually here on the, the pin that works the, the head of the coupler. And I will also, uh, on some cars where I need to get in for the, the reverse pin, is I'll put some uh, inside here as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one apart. This one's really easy. One of our plastic cars. I'm going to pop off this bottom pin section. And I'm actually going to get in here and just put a little tuft of graphite down in that. There you go. One thing that I do, do hear a lot sometimes on our, our plastic trucks, there's another little extra tip specific to the O gauge, uh, is if you have a coupler that starts to get a little loose, uh, it may not be a lubrication problem. Sometimes these plastic um, pin bars do get a little bit out of, out of kilter. So if you pop this off the car, and you saw how easy I did that there, I just took a, a regular flathead screwdriver near the center of the car, the bolster, where this pin locks it into place, and just give it a quick pop up, and then it'll pop right out. Um, just give it a little bit, a little bit of a bend like this, okay? And then when you pop it back into place, uh, you'll have a good contact again. Very easy to do. So if you're starting to have a, a, a loose bar, uh, you don't necessarily need to replace the truck. Just pop that off. Give it a little bend. Don't bend it too hard or you'll snap it. Uh, but this is designed to flex. That's how it how it releases. And then you can pop it back into place. You shouldn't have that problem with some of our higher-end trucks that are more metal construction. But uh, real easy one on some of the, the, the train set cars. And then once that's back in there, just finally now get around to popping this wheel set back in place. And we're good to go. And now this car is good for another, at the rate we rerun them, eight, 82 years of service. But <laughs> um, good for a, a good long time on, on your layout. Uh, I do typically recommend... Um, putting your cars through a regular cycle of maintenance. Uh, try and check them about once a year. Um, if you only get the cars, the trains out at the holiday times, so well, it's easy to remember when you last checked them. Um, uh, if you have a large layout that stays up all the time, it can get away from you. Uh, if you're a person who gets into the operating cycles of a, a model railroad, depending on how regularly you, you have operating sessions, if you have car cards and waybills, we haven't talked about that yet on Workbench Wednesday. We might do that some some point down the line. It's a lot of fun, a great aspect of the hobby. Uh, I've seen a lot of hobbyists come up with great ways that uh, they will schedule on that routing car routing form uh, a position where it goes into the car shop, so to speak, uh, for, for service and maintenance. So you can sort of keep track of those things. Uh, a, real, uh, a real good way to, to keep up with it. Uh, but definitely something you want to keep up with over time. Uh, next thing I want to talk about a little bit with couplers is their height, um, and in the smaller gauges, uh, specifically uh, the, the trip pin operation. And again, there are NMRA standards for this. Um, these include determining the proper height of the coupler from the rail, uh, and the, uh, the, the proper dimensions of the coupler itself, so that everyone's couplers will interchange with each other. Lionel HO, we use all metal couplers for better reliability. Some manufacturers use plastic couplers, some use metal, some use some different sizes and details, but all of them are, are really interchangeable. I do prefer metal over plastic on my couplers. I like to run longer trains. I like to have switching operations, so the cars are taking a little bit more of a beating. Um, and I just find that the metal couplers hold up better over, over the years. So even though our Lionel HO rolling stock was designed to be very budget friendly, low on some of the details and uh, things that uh, that aren't quite as uh, noticeable right away, but a little more friendly to the pocket. We did make sure that we didn't skimp on metal wheels and metal couplers uh, because those things, well, we could have taken some dollars out of the cost of the car, made those out of plastic. 
it's just no fun if your train's not running. So we, we kept those in, in HO. All of our cars have metal wheels and uh, metal couplers, something that we wanted to, to stick with. But uh, replacing these couplers, very easy to do. Uh, we sell replacements. Uh, you can get those uh, through us directly. Other manufacturers make them as well. Um, you can buy them in bulk. Uh, I'm not going to replace the couplers here because I don't have to. They're already nice, nice couplers that work well. Uh, but there are a couple of things you want to look for on a coupler. The first is the centering spring, which is, you can see this uh, copper colored piece here in the middle. Uh, this is what keeps the coupler in line side to side. And as you go around a corner, brings it back to, to center. Okay, so that's your centering spring. And those can wear out a little bit over time too, but typically they, they spring back. If you put too much force, they get sticky. Again, over time, they bend out. It's a very simple copper spring. Looks just like this. Open up this package here. Okay. And uh, if it's not assembled right, sometimes, again, just like with the other car, just a little bit of bend on that, that spring there will bring it back in and restores your tension. If not, we sell replacements of these too. So our other manufacturers, if you're using other brands of cars, take the old one out, pop the new one in, you're done in a couple of seconds. Um, then make sure that you don't, when you put the cover, coupler cover back on, you don't over tighten that because that can also deform the, the coupler spring in there. The other spring in the coupler is the knuckle spring. And that is on the side of the, the coupler. Look, hopefully you can, hopefully this zooms in and you can see it sort of working in the shadow here a little bit. Uh, but there is a small metal spring, coil spring, here between the, the movable head and the main frame of the coupler. And this is what keeps the coupler head closed in normal operation. Those will also sometimes spring out. Um, and they will go somewhere in your room never to be seen again. Um, if, you, if an archaeologist ever goes to any house I've ever lived in and does a fine sift of the floor, they're going to find thousands of these little springs and wonder what the hell humankind was using them for. Uh, but the uh, they're easy enough to replace uh, as well. And I like to use a uh, hobby knife. I'll, I'll do one of these and try not to zing it across the room as I do it. I almost certainly will. Uh, but the easiest way to do this, let me get it a little bit closer. Let me get my, my cradle back here. Foam cradles, another great tool. Uh, I've had this one for about 30 years. Um, it was made by Bowser at the time. Uh, there are plenty of uh, manufacturers that make these all scales and gauges again. Um, if you have to replace a spring, pick up the spring on the side of your uh, coupler. Do I have a spring in my box here? That chance? Nope. Wouldn't be that lucky. Um, with the knife, I'm going to take this one out. Okay, there it goes. Okay, so there's the spring. Hopefully you're seeing that there on the end of the knife. I can get that in focus. I find it actually easiest to start with the spring on the base of the coupler. And then using the knife to help compress it, compress the spring and close the knuckle on the spring. And that one just shot somewhere into the workbench. So let me go find my uh, box of coupler springs here. I don't have them handy. Um, the idea here is put the spring in, pull back and hold tight, and then close the knuckle onto the spring, and then pull out, and you'll have a, a good working coupler again. Uh, very easy enough, enough to do, despite the fact that I've just shown you how easy it is not to do it. It will take a few attempts, usually, 
to get that in there right. Um, it's a tiny little spring. This one you might see the spring a little bit easier on. Uh, it's just a little tiny spring in there. Uh, but there's two posts, one on the head of the coupler, one on the, the base near the coupler shank. And you can just set that in there, close the knuckle on it, and you're good to go. All right. We'll set that aside and respring that one a little bit later on. The uh, other operation that you want to check with on your cars is for the coupler height and especially the trip pin height. We didn't talk about the trip pin here. The trip pin is used uh, just like those uh, thumbtacks or the hidden uncoupling tabs on the O-gauge cars. Uh, the, this is used on, with an under-the-track magnet that will pull the, the pin to the side and open the coupler for you. Uh, real handy device. Uh, if you're not using that, a lot of, a lot of modelers will, uh, for the, the realism and the, the lack of maintenance on it, just chop this pin off. Easy enough to do with a set of pliers. Uh, but uh, for operations, I, I tend to kind of like them. The, uh, the KD company uh, was one of the first companies to mass produce this metal style of knuckle coupler, and they make standard gauges that will very quickly show you how to confirm the coupler height and the trip pin height. Highly recommend grabbing one of those. But if you don't have one, uh, you can get the same results with a piece of track and a small shim. I'm actually going to use, because it should be the right height, yep, my NMRA gauge again. And I'm going to lay it flat here. And I'm going to place the car on the rails. Hopefully in frame, yep. And you'll see that the trip pin clears that gauge without any problem. So that means it's the right height. It's above, it's enough above the rail head that if I have a re-railing track, if I have switch points, if I have a, a rail joint that's a little bit high or low or a magnet, I'm not going to pick that switch. I'm not going to have the coupler come in and pick that and, and cause a derailment or cause an uncoupling. Check the other side here. See if we have the same result. And here we're good. If you get a coupler that's low, it's a shame when the factory builds everything right and you don't have any <laughs> any issues to correct, except for the ones you create by undoing their work and shooting springs across the office. Uh, all right, here's one that's been run for a while and it's just a little bit low. That coupler is just, just hitting that. Uh, we're going to fix that. Real easy fix. Also available at your hobby shop, also made by KD, K-A-D-E-E -E, uh, company. This is a pair of trip pin pliers. It's got uh, a round uh, concave opening here and a, a set of round uh, ends that, that fall into it. To adjust, you can adjust the coupler down by going this way with it. Okay. Or typically 99.5% of the time what you have to do is adjust the coupler up. So you put the, uh, the barrel side towards the knuckle and then give it a little bit of a squeeze. And that will curve up the end of the, the coupler a bit. And if I got that right. Yep. Now we clear with no problems here. So again, it takes two seconds to fix these things. When I travel uh, to a, a, an open house or a, a model railroad operating session or when we take our club layout to a show, one of these pliers is always in my go bag uh, with the layout tools, just like the NMRA gauge uh, and some other basics, some lubricants and things like that. Because whether it's a piece of my equipment or another club member's equipment, if you're having a problem like that where it's picking a switch, this is super easy to uh, just jump in there and give it a... Uh, give it a twist with the, with these knuckles and you fix that problem right away. So uh, again, not a very expensive uh, hand tool, but uh, if you're, if you're a modeler and you like cool tools, this is one that should be in your toolbox. Um, at least, at least one set. If you can always keep track of it, doesn't hurt to have a second set. If you travel a lot and, and work in multiple places to keep these, these handy. I think we've covered quite a good bit on trucks and couplers tonight. Uh, going almost an, an hour on that. It's not always, like I said, not always the most exciting, glamorous topic. Uh, at the end of the night of checking your, your rolling stock, you don't have this beautiful new model in front of you to, uh, to enjoy and show off. 
but on the other hand, you have a set of trains that run beautifully well and are ready to run and enjoy the next time you go to the train room and turn on the power and run trains and not be frazzled by derailments. So uh, you really want to take some time to, to do this um, and, uh, and, and take your time and enjoy it. Like I said, it's great uh, Sunday afternoon activity or Saturday afternoon activity or Monday night activity or Tuesday, Thursday night activity when you're watching the football game. Sit there and check some coupler heights, check some gauges, uh, put a couple drops of lubrication in your uh, truck journals, and uh, away you go uh, when you go back to run trains next time. So real fun thing to do. Uh, it's, it's maintenance, it's a chore, but it's, it's worth every penny. We're going to be back here in two weeks for our next uh, Workbench Wednesday episode. We're going to have a fun treat. Uh, it's October, or will be October by that point. And uh, for those of you who have been around uh, our Lionel crew for a while, you know Megan Frazier. She's one of our project managers. She handles our accessories. She handles our HO line. Wonderful, wonderful young woman who has a, a tremendous creative uh, streak in her. And one of her passions is Halloween. So this is her month. In fact, uh, she started decorating the office uh, in August for Halloween because it's, it's her thing. And so in two weeks, we're going to do a special Halloween house. Uh, and it'll be a special one with the two of us uh, working together. We're going to take one of our O-Gage houses and uh, scary it up. Because whether you're into Halloween or you just want that creepy house at the end of the block that the kids all cross the street to walk past, uh, we can have a lot of fun with our models. So we're going to do that one together. And uh, we will uh, we'll start that one in two weeks on the 13th appropriately enough uh, for our, our early Halloween episode. And uh, Dave has promised not to stop by in his Ursula costume, but uh, anything's possible. So look forward to seeing you all back here again in two weeks for the next Workbench Wednesday. Uh, we're getting back into train season. We're getting ready for a lot of fun. Uh, we will be on the road again towards the end of October to the uh, York train show. As long as everything's uh, rolling up there, Lionel will be there. Uh, with some some great news and, and happenings. Uh, Dave will be back very soon with some more demos with Dave's. He's got things rolling along there. We've got new product coming into the office uh, really almost every day, uh, as fast as the shipping companies can get it to us, uh, which uh, is never seems to be fast enough. But we are getting things uh, in and new things to look at and talk about and turn around and get out to you so you have it in time uh, for your big train season this year. Uh, but lots of lots of wonderful things coming coming into the office. So stick around. You'll see a lot more of myself, uh, Dave, Megan, uh, the whole team uh, as we gear up for, for train season. We're happy to be back and uh, back into the swing of things. Appreciate your patronage and your viewership and, and your patience with me tonight and look forward to seeing you down the line. Thanks, everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and enjoy your trains.